Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to the Human Revolution. Keitner, I found out what Burke's been concealing. The interrogation wing is some kind of medical testing facility. He's using the prisoners as lab rats. For what? Not sure. I'll need Burke's retinal scan data to find out. I can't download that without setting off a million alarms. However, you still have that retinal prosthesis you stole from his office? If you're suggesting I use it to fool a retinal scanner, it won't work. The eye synthetic tissue spike needs to be connected to a real optic nerve. Otherwise, it just reads as metal. I know. That's why you need to take it to Quinn. I'll tell him to expect you. Keitner out. Interesting. So because Burke has a false eye, a uh, augmented eye, we can fake it. Fake his information by getting a copy of his augmented eye and um, hacking it. But unfortunately, Jensen can't do the hacking, so he has to get it to... Uh... Hmm. Access denied. Well, fair enough. But yes, because uh, Jensen can't do the hacking, he needs to get it over to Quinn. You remember him, right? And of course, that also means forced backtracking. Yay. By the way, that orange thing was a scholar book. Yeah, there are different colors in this DLC than the normal ones. It's kind of interesting. Yes, I'm jumping back here because right here is where they finally, you know, send in reinforcements. We'd all like to be in the middle of the action and odds, but we're stuck here. It's better than policing civilians like Jones. Isn't he stationed in China? Drag that must be. I don't know. It just sounds like a fun time for this especially when we're sitting. There's a hotel there, full of service girls. You know what I mean? Maybe you're right. Wouldn't have to deal with Burke and his ass hat. Well, you know, these guys are working for Keitner, and I'd like to do her a favor. So I'll just knock these two guys out. I mean, maybe some of these other people I've killed will also work for Keitner, but that hasn't been confirmed. For those two, it has. So for this area here, and just this area, we'll knock these folks out. See, aside from these two, they're... Oh, here's somebody. Damn it. So why did they only just pop in like that? I, I saw them appear on the radar instead of come in off the edge. It's kind of annoying. I think I might have shot too high. But hey, if he wants to run out in front of cover, I'm not going to stop him. Alright, well. That was relatively painless. Hey look, I, I didn't even go below 100 health. And they all got pistol ammo, which is nice. So let's head back on down here. And uh, basically you could have skipped Quinn, by the way, up to this point. But this little quest here ensures that you have to talk to him at least once. So, what's the story? Just got off the horn with the commander. She says you got something for me to take a look at. Prosthetic eye, one of Burke's. We needed to get past a retinal scan, but it's useless like this. I. 
Without an active neural connection, it might as well be an expensive paper weight. <laughs> may as well put a golf stopper in front of the scanner for all the good that thing will do you. Solutions, Quinn. Think you can handle this? Lad, I may be just a mechanic, but I'm also the only thing keeping this whole bleeding facility from sinking into the abyss. Think I can manage a simple optic frequency bypass. Just let me get me tools. Right. So that's it now. You got the eye. Sorry it took a little longer than I expected. Nearly break the damn thing once or twice. New TYM firmware and such. Now don't go fucking around with it. It's only got a limited lifespan due to the temp power source I rigged. It's only good for one use. Got it? This is pretty impressive work for a mechanic, Quinn. What's that supposed to mean? There's more old Quinn than meets the eye. No pun intended. You wouldn't be the first fool to underestimate my know-how. Well, there's more to this job than just a simple battery swap. I saw you modifying the BIOS. This is state-of-the-art hardware and software. You're not just a mechanic. You're a hacker. What are you going on about now? Ain't nothing you couldn't pull off with a degree in computer engineering and a little elbow grease. Come off it now. We ain't got time for this. Is it supposed to be moving? Aye. Bloody creepy, that is. Try not to pay it any mind now. Thing's stuck in calibration mode. Trick is, I got it thinking it's plugged into a new host. And by rewriting the system diagnostic checks, it'll keep trying to connect without detecting anything's amiss, which in turn keeps it alive in a manner of speaking. Fucking brilliant piece of engineering work if I don't just myself. Why only one use? Without being hooked up to a proper battery, like your brain. The voltage spike from a single scan will trip the surge protectors, shutting it down to prevent further transmissions. It's a redundant safety mechanism built into the optic nerve to prevent frying your noggin in a dorsal ventral feedback loop. Short of putting the thing in your own head, which I ain't exactly equipped to do, there's no way around it. Besides, I think the commander preferred this way. Well, hopefully this thing works. It'll work just dandy so long as you don't do something stupid like drop it. And it ain't a bloody webcam. So don't try using it to spy the knickers up someone's skirt. I gotta go. I think it goes without saying, but uh, we never met, alright? Pretty sure there's nobody on this station wearing a skirt. Anyway, two more praxis. So let's boost the recharge rate since that's more valuable than extra batteries. And... hmm. What to do with that last one? already got most of what I need. There's some stuff I could have, but... Eh. I suppose robot domination might come in handy. It's a little... a little too late for the primary use of it, but... Well, whatever. You didn't have to backtrack twice to get back to the elevator here. You're welcome. So let's just get on with the plot. Access granted. Ah, damn it. I forgot to take a look at it. Hey! There's the second storage device I picked up in the uh, medical area. Huh. Jensen, it's Keitner. Where are you? In a well-concealed elevator inside the prison's restricted wing. Your gun-running neural engineer deserves a raise. I take it the eye worked then. Good. Now listen, if what you say is true, if Burke really is using the prisoners here as lab rats, I need proof. Hard evidence that I can take to Interpol. An entire prison full of kidnapped civilians isn't enough? You're an ex-cop, Jensen. You tell me. How many death row inmates crying on about their innocence have you seen getting out? Point taken. I'll see what I can find. It's a little more effective when they are provably innocent victims who are abducted, you know? What else do we have down here? Pods that need constant rotation. Kind of like wine barrels or some such. 
the 360 rotation too. It's interesting. I suppose it's so they can keep the animation going forever, but still. Well, fuck. Please. Please don't leave me like this. No hope. Nothing to do but kill me. Beg you. I guess they do have skirts on this base. I had a messed up way of having them, though. Oh, Moon Base Omega. I won't be able to read it all the way with her talking. Try it now. Yep. They are off on some sort of ethical debate, and uh, seems like they will need it. Trauma kit. I'm not sure I even need to use this thing. There's Moon Base Omega. According to Commander Burke, initial field tests are positive. Operatives report function within expected parameters. Never mind the cost. Alright, so maybe I should just spell this out for you, because we're pretty much going to learn it soon anyway. What's happening here is uh, these folks are creating a an AI system uh, well, here's the here's the uh, visual diagram actually they, they are creating a special computer system with an organic component these poor women that allows their teams to um, teams to coordinate far better and more directly than they ever could have without it these are all the pancheas that we'll need to Fix global warming, by the way. Right now there's one in the Arctic, but apparently four more that could be built. But yes, apparently the women, and it's always women for some reason, some genetic component of the X uh, gene that is just nullified by the Y or something like that. It, it uh... It, they always burn out. Quite the house of horrors you got here, Doc. You letting anyone in, or just women? Who are you? How'd you get down here? This is a restricted area. Obviously. You wouldn't want the rank and file knowing what kind of sick experimentation is going on down here. No, you, you don't understand. I'm not... Where's Burke? And your research partner, Savage? Burke went back up to the base. And Gary... Gary left. Told me to be smart, keep my mouth shut, and do whatever Burke tells me to do. For now. For now? I heard the three of you talking up there in the morgue. Sounded like you don't exactly fit in here, Dr. Um... Kavanagh. And who the fuck are you? The name's Jensen. I came here looking for someone. Megan Reed. Reed? I I've seen her research. Gary thinks it could be the key we're missing. If she can be convinced to come here. Megan Reed was kidnapped, Kavanaugh. Violently. As was her entire scientific team and the dozens of women you've been torturing down here. No! You, you don't understand. I'm trying to save them. Gary and I, we were sent here to put the OCM project back on track. It wasn't until we got here that we realized what that meant. And by then, by then it was too late. OCM. Savage used that term in the morgue. What does it mean? Organic Computational Matrix. It's a means of cross-connecting living brain tissue and artificial intelligence systems to create a supercomputer of unparalleled capability. Part flesh, part silicon. 
That's what you're doing down here, turning prisoners into computer parts. Human brain activity has to be integrated with the technology, or else it won't work. Even DARPA knew that. Just how many prisoners are being wired into this thing? I... I don't know. But a lot of them don't seem to survive for more than a year. I've told the others there's no way this project can stay viable with these kinds of numbers. But the OCM computers have to have them to work. Computers? You mean there's more than one of them? There's... several. This is just where the process starts. The factory floor. We select the candidates here, implant them, and ship them to the other locations. It's all very efficient. Yeah, except your candidates keep dying. What does DARPA have to do with this? Nothing. Not directly. In 2007, they started looking for research partners to help develop an artificial cognitive science program that could increase a soldier's situational awareness in the field. A number of private sector companies submitted proposals. Bell Tower being one of them. No. Bell Tower was a private military corporation. DARPA wanted researchers. But one of the companies who did submit something was a biotech corporation that deals with Bell Tower. And they believed a successful program could be designed if it could be wired directly into the soldiers' brains. DARPA wasn't willing to go that far. So this biotech company took the idea to Bell Tower. A corporation that being privately funded, doesn't have to concern itself with political or ethical debate. You seem to think Megan's research is integral to salvaging this project of yours. Why? It's not my project. Had I known before I came here... Right, just answer the question. <sighs> We're experiencing cross-systemic failures with the tech. Over time, subjects implanted with OCM augmentations suffer complete neurological breakdown. They... They pretty much burn up from the inside. Gary thinks it's a problem with the acceptance of the P-dot array. I've heard that phrase before. It's the building block of modern neuro-augmentations. Dr. Reed's been reshaping it, changing the way it bonds with living tissue. The mutagenic gene combination she's introduced into it, well, frankly, it's astonishing. Enough to warrant her kidnapping? So she'd be forced to work on this project with you? She's not on this project. I don't know what she's doing or where she is. This is the first time anyone's ever mentioned kidnapping. You're really gonna stand there and try to justify your role in this, aren't you? People are being enslaved, Kavanaugh. Enslaved and crucified. It, it wasn't like that at first. I thought we were gonna make a difference, do something incredible for the world. Right. And look how incredible it turned out to be. But you can still make a difference, Doctor. You can help me blow the lid off this place. Are you insane? I can't! There's too much money invested in this. Burke, the people I work for, they'll kill me. They'll hunt me down and kill me. I know people who can protect you, hide you. Interpol is just waiting for evidence to tear Bell Tower apart. It's not just Bell Tower. Oh, God. Oh, God, am I really gonna do this? <laughs> you... You can't get me out through the prison. Burke would stop us. Then we'll have to do what Savage did. Take a submersible. We can't. The hatches to all the docking hangers are locked tight. The only way to unlock them is by using the security console in the prison command tower. But keeps an eye on us that way. Then I'll have to go back up there and unlock it. Well, you gather as much evidence as you can carry. Oh my god. I'm really gonna do this. Damn right you are. Now get moving. I'll contact you when I unlock the hatch. All right. Fine. But Mr. Jensen, please, hurry. I'm working as fast as I can, Mr. Jensen. There's just so much data. The OCM project is quite complex, and I don't want to trigger any security alerts that might warn Burke of what we're doing. Got it. That's all I wanted to know. I'll be in touch soon. Yeah, we'll just get more details from her if we ask. Alright, another two Praxis points. Man, even just in the DLC I'm running out of ways to use it. I mean, some of this stuff could come in handy, but, you know, I don't need it to come in handy. Guess we can run faster. That's something. Hmm. Improve the fortify function. Hack better. You know, I think I forgot to look at that computer. 
and I kind of debating here whether or not to kill her, but I'm about to blow the lid off this place and all sorts of reinforcements in. Maybe one of them will be able to save her, or at least relieve her pain. So for that possibility, I'll let her live. Keitner, contact Interpol. We need rendezvous coordinates for a deep sea submersible. A what? What exactly have you found, Jensen? A research complex hidden beneath this base. One of its staff is willing to turn whistleblower, if we can deliver her to Interpol using one of the lab's transport subs. Which explains why you need the coordinates. I'll see what I can do. Keitner out. So I guess Gary Savage has worked on the ocean floor twice. I suppose this is back before he uh, got sick of the ethics himself. He seemed like he was kind of on the fence, but uh, maybe can't. Oh. Keitner, what the hell's going on? The elevator stopped. Burke must have intercepted our comms. Get the hell out of there, Jensen. I'll meet you. Well, this just got complicated. For some reason, I can't jump while I'm in the elevator, even though it's stopped. Oh, well. Hmm. I'm just... I'm never gonna come back here, so I'm making sure... I've uh, found everything I can find. Why, why is there no ladder up to this next floor? What is the point of not having that? Or this next floor after this one, too. <laughs> I mean, I, I get the reason why it's more interesting on a gaming level, but... Uh, you know, in terms of... Oh, wait. You can get up to the next floor after this one, too. Oh, nice. Even more Praxis. <laughs> oh, man. So much Praxis. Well, might as well find a use for it. Boost stealth. Now I can really kick those computer systems' asses. Looks like we're in a crawl space upstairs here. Although I don't know why you would store grenades up there. Also, the guys stopped the elevator. Why do they think I'll come out of the elevator? They know I can't. Well, whatever. Oh, come on. Okay, let's try tossing this over the top here. Hey. Nice and effective. Oh, crap. For cat, I can't breathe gas fumes anymore. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, more painkillers. Well, unlike those guys from earlier, these guys guaranteed to work for Burke at this point. Uh, nobody in the medical wing, for some reason. And that one prisoner has been transferred. But hey, so long as she's on the base and nobody's actively working on her. Warning. Gas dispersal. Oh. Activating security scan. Biometric data assembled. Man, this thing takes a long time. Subject recognized. 
access granted. That's weird. You didn't revoke my access? Keitner! We really broke open a hornet's nest, didn't we? Jensen. It's bad. You need a medic. <laughs> yeah, I'll get right on that. Got those coordinates, Jensen. But Burke figured it out. Seized control of the station and locked down the detention camp. Bastard's cleaning house. I've got to get Kavanaugh out. Can't. Not until you stop the gas. What gas? Burke's enacted a scorched earth protocol to stop the truth from getting out. Poison gas in every cell. Lab two. Unless you stop it. Stay with me, Keitner. There's a circuit board underneath the prison command tower. It directs the flow. Everything's connected, but might be able to redirect. The whistleblower has to live, Jensen. Only sure way. We stop this. Keitner. Keitner. Well, at least she didn't go down easy. Detention silo is secure. Lockdown is complete, and Keitner has been taken care of. Out. You're sure that bitch is dead, right? She's dead. I got her before she could reach the restricted area checkpoint. Tough chick. Took a lot to take her down. Don't know what the hell she thought she was doing, though. Fuck her. Bitch killed a lot of good men. Just stay alert for this Agent Burke mention. The guy stationed in the restricted area should be able to handle him if he shows his face. But you never know. Right. How good can they be to watch this happen? No, I'm here, but hey, I know they're here. Come back here. Oh, look. There's no timer on the interface, but there is one in the room. Convenient. Alright, so attacking them from this floor is kind of difficult. So I'm going to do the easy thing and take one of the uh, hidden ways down and shoot them on the floor where they're stationed. Alright. Looks like that's it for this floor. I mean, some of them might be invisible, but I didn't hear the telltale sign. The telltale sound, I mean. So if I can just get rid of these two guys here. third guy or no he just hadn't finished dying all right that's that still got at least seven minutes to go I think so let's go up to the the chamber where you can change the gas flow tough choice ahead of you Bratan. the prisoners always a war you can't save both what the hacker from the ship You've been listening this whole time? Like Zietke said, everything's connected. Right now, gas is set to disperse evenly between the prison and the lab. All you can do in here is redirect flow out of one area into the other. Do nothing. Everybody dies. Do something. Somebody dies faster. Precisely. But if you want to bring down Bell Tower, the choice is clear. All three endings are viable. So, 
If you live in the United States, at least, there's a good chance that you've read the subject of today's dystopia corner in school. It's a novel written in 1993 that became an instant classic and has had a big impact on a lot of people's lives. The book in question is The Giver by Lois Lowry. About the author. Lois Lowry was born in 1937 as the middle daughter of an army dentist, and as such she grew up in just about every corner of the country. This trend continued even after Lowry graduated from high school because she married another military man when she was 19 and had only completed two years of college. Lowry gave birth to four kids in five years during the first years of her marriage, and she and her husband eventually managed to settle down in Maine in the early 60s. In 1972, Lowry finished her bachelor's degree at the University of Southern Maine and continued on with graduate studies and began to turn her writing hobby into a profession. In 1977, after 20 years of marriage, Lowry divorced her husband since the two had gradually drifted apart as Lowry resumed the career she had previously abandoned. That same year, she officially became a professional author, and she met the man who would be her future companion, though they were never officially married, until his death in 2011. Lowry has said that the one running theme throughout all of her books has been the importance of human connections the bonds we forge to turn a group of people into friends, and groups of friends into communities. And human connections certainly are important. I believe I've mentioned this before, but the only way our perspectives and opinions can grow and change is with additional input. And the best kind of input is the kind that comes from other people, either directly through conversations and interactions, or indirectly through stories, media, and written advice. Lowry's work over the years has covered a variety of topics and styles, although, like Margaret Atwood, she tends to prefer literary fiction to genre fiction. Her first novel was A Summer to Die, a very fictionalized retelling of the death of her sister. Just in general, Lowry's treated her writing as a way for her to cope with problems and troubles over the years. In 1995, her son died in a jet plane crash, and she said she was only able to move on thanks to her writing career. The success of The Giver was something of a shock to Lowry. In an introduction to the book she wrote 20 years after the original publication, she describes how she still gets 50 letters and emails some days about The Giver. How many of these letters are more than just the ones teachers make their classes write after a reading assignment, and how, at times, full-grown adults have discovered her book and it changed their lives. Psychologists recommend The Giver to recovering cult members. Teens considering suicide have changed their minds after reading the book. And parents name their kids Gabriel in honor of the youngest character in the book. Soon after the book's publication, Jeff Bridges attempted to get a movie adaptation going, but it fell into development hell and only re-emerged in the early 2010s thanks to the big boom in young adult dystopias. It finally came out in 2014, and got a decent amount of money, but from what I hear, it was pretty disappointing when compared to the book. I haven't seen it myself, but from what I hear, it's not as action-packed as the trailer made it out to be, but it is more shallow than the book. Incidentally, Lowry wrote three sequels to The Giver, but I'll wait to describe them until after... The Story the protagonist is a boy in his 11th year named Jonas. He lives in a very orderly society where bicycles are the main mode of transport, word choice is extremely important, attention to neatness is a public concern, and your job assignment is determined in December when all 50 11s become 12s. But there's nothing to really fear from this assignment. Children are observed throughout their lives to determine their inclinations, so the job the community's Committee of Elders gives you is almost certainly the one you would have picked out for yourself. Nevertheless, Jonas is apprehensive about the upcoming ceremony, since it is a pretty big deal. Younger kids have their own milestones during the annual event, but that's only stuff like getting new uniforms, haircuts, or, or the right to ride a bike. The Ceremony of Twelve is something altogether different, and while many of his friends have an idea of what they want to do based on how they spend their free time, Jonas has no particular interests. However, he does have moments where objects seem to flash in some mysterious way. 
Jonas lives in a family unit with a mother, a father, and a younger sister, Lily. Like their jobs, adults are assigned their partners based on observed compatibility, and once they've lived with each other for a while, they can apply for one male and one female child. Love and familial bonds are kind of a factor in these relationships, but it's altogether weaker than it is in real life, and sex has absolutely no presence. Birth mother is a possible job assignment, and that's all handled through artificial insemination. One day, the father, who works as a nurturer, talks about one of the babies which he and his fellows care for until they're old enough to be assigned a family. One of the babies is underdeveloped, so father wants to give him an extra year and some personal attention from his family. So, with his family's consent, he brings the new child home and asks them to call him Gabriel which technically isn't his name until he gets a family. It's important that Gabriel develop correctly, because if he doesn't, the community will have to release him. The elderly are also released, as are those who commit very bad actions. But all anyone knows or says about release is that the released person goes elsewhere. A few days later, Jonas has a very strange dream about wanting to see his friend Fiona naked, and then wanting something more he can't identify. He shares his dream with his parents, who explain that this was his first stirring, and now he'll need to take pills for the rest of his adult life to make sure his stirrings don't come back. It's a moment of pride, since it means he's growing up. The day of the ceremony comes. After waiting for all of the other age groups to go through their milestones, it's time for the new Twelves to receive their job assignments. To everyone's surprise, the announcer skips Jonas when it's his turn. But that's because Jonas has a very special job. He is to be the new receiver, an important job that will make him an equal to the Committee of Elders once he's finished training. The last receiver was selected ten years ago, but something went wrong, and so the Elders were very careful in selecting a new one. The job demands intelligence, integrity, courage, and wisdom, but it also isolates him from all his peers. Jonas gets a list of rules for his new job and finds out that he's allowed to ask anyone any question and he's allowed to lie. But he's not allowed to discuss his training or take any medication except for illnesses or injuries. That means he's allowed to drop the stirring meds. He also can't apply for release, which normally every citizen has a right to do. For the first day of his job, Jonas goes to the Annex and meets the previous receiver, who says he should now be called the Giver. The Giver of Memories, to be precise. The process turns out to be surprisingly easy. Jonas takes off his shirt and lies down, Giver touches his back, and a memory of sledding down a snow-covered hill enters Jonas's mind. With it come experiences he's never encountered before freezing cold, the swirl of snow, and even the idea of something steep enough to be called a hill. His second memory is of sunbathing on the beach, and so he learns about sunshine, sand, and sunburns. Long ago, the community imposed a sameness that got rid of all of these things so that people would stop making bad decisions and suffering the consequences. One way they maintain this sameness is to lock up the memories of things being different and drop them all on the shoulders of one individual, the receiver. They would get rid of the memories entirely, but they can still offer some useful advice and perspectives, which is what makes the receiver so important. As Jonas continues his training, the flashing he got before he started comes back and starts to last longer. The giver explains that what he's experiencing is the color red. The sameness not only leveled the hills and flattened sunshine into a glowing sky, it also turned the world monochromatic. Something else that's missing is music. Weeks go by, and Jonas starts to wonder why the community gave up on the vibrancy of life for the sake of the sameness. So the giver gives him a harsh memory, a memory in which he falls off his sled and breaks his leg. And then the giver slowly shares darker and darker memories. Memories of starvation, regret, destruction, and eventually, warfare. After experiencing all of this, Jonas suggests that these memories would be easier to bear if they were shared. 
but the giver and the receiver are isolated precisely because the community doesn't want to share or experience them. Meanwhile, Gabriel is spending nights with Jonas's family. While he's passing infant milestones fine, he's having real trouble sleeping at night. Without realizing it, Jonas shares a pleasant memory with Gabriel, and while doing so didn't work when he tried it on a friend, Gabriel accepts the memory and quiets down for the night. Gabriel is restless the next night, so Jonas keeps giving him happy memories. The giver shares a memory of a Christmas morning spent with parents and grandparents, and Jonas realizes that love and family have also been flattened by the sameness. During a holiday, Jonas watches some young kids playing at fighting, and that triggers his wartime memories. And at this point, he realizes that the isolation of the receiver isn't some community imposition. It's the fact that his experiences diverge far too much for anyone else to understand him. One day, a pair of identical twins are born, and Jonas's father has to decide which one to release to elsewhere. So Jonas asks the giver about release. And the giver quite plainly explains to him that when people in the community say release, what they really mean is death. And that's whether or not they realize it. The last receiver couldn't handle the painful memories, so she requested release and assisted at suicide. And her actions are why Jonas is prohibited from doing the same. When the elderly are released, they are given a lethal injection by their caretakers. And when Jonas's father made a decision about the twins, he casually injected poison into one of their skulls and dumped the body down a waste chute. This action was recorded because no one considers it wrong, and so the giver plays it back for Jonas's benefit. This scene, just so you know, is why the giver is frequently banned from schools. The protagonists are all appropriately horrified by this event, but some parents don't think that kids should even realize that bad things can happen. At this point, Jonas and the Giver agree that something has to change. When the last receiver died, the few memories she had collected had returned to the community and caused a serious disruption. Jonas has now been a receiver for a year instead of the last one's weeks, and so if his memories were to rejoin the community, it could put an end to sameness altogether. Fortunately, he doesn't have to kill himself to release his memories. The same thing will happen if he goes beyond the community's boundaries and escapes to elsewhere, for real. Meanwhile, the giver will stay behind to help the community cope with their newfound memories. Jonas and the giver come up with a plan to get him to elsewhere safely, but that goes out the window when Jonas discovers Gabriel will be released the next morning. He escapes with the baby and all the food he can gather, and he spends many days walking down roads and hiding from helicopters. Because it's winter, Jonas and Gabriel start to get cold as they leave the community's influence. Jonas and Gabriel are going hungry. Jonas has no survival skills, and he's becoming exhausted, but he continues on. Eventually, Jonas reaches a snow-covered hill and spots the sled he knew would be there at the top. He and Gabriel slide down the hill's other side on the sled, and at the bottom, Jonas sees a house where a family is celebrating Christmas. And as Jonas's memories bleed into his reality, the book ends. The Analysis Let me start with the ending this time. The way The Giver ends is ambiguous, and it reminds me of a pair of films I watched back in the aughts. Pan's Labyrinth, directed by Guillermo del Toro, and The Orphanage, produced by Del Toro. The plot of each movie is pretty different, but they both have a similar structure. Something fantastic and supernatural is going on, but it's not so fantastic that you couldn't explain the story using real-world events and logic. But while I preferred the fantasy ending of Pan's Labyrinth, I found myself accepting the real-world explanation for The Orphanage. I bring this up because I've had a similar experience with the ending to The Giver. Back when I read this book in school, I was sure that Jonas and Gabriel lived at the end. But now that I've read it as an adult, it seems more likely to me that Jonas was hallucinating and he and the baby slowly froze to death in the middle of nowhere. Lois Lowry has written other books in this universe, and in Messenger she reveals that Jonas and Gabriel both survived, 
but like I've said before, that doesn't invalidate my interpretation of the ending. I do have to acknowledge that these sequels exist, but if I want to stop here and believe that Jonas and Gabriel died to save the community, that's my right as a reader. Still, the ending is not what The Giver is all about. The Giver is about emotions and the way they connect us to each other, for good and for ill. To achieve the peace of sameness, the community had to stop hating enough to kill, to stop grieving enough to commit suicide, to stop feeling happy enough to share that happiness, and to stop loving enough to protect others. To become the same, the community had to flatten the hills and level the valleys, to desaturate the world and forget about heat and cold, to forget the past and ignore the future. Unlike the novel We, The Giver isn't a direct allegory to the Garden of Eden, but the parallels are certainly there. To achieve happiness and contentment, the community sacrificed its understanding of the world, its knowledge of good and evil, and it contented itself with shadow puppets. The members of the community are like the cave dwellers of Plato's allegory, seeing only shadows on a wall and confusing it with reality, since those shadows are the only things they've ever known. Which is ironic in a sense, because the giver is also very influenced by Plato's Republic. A council of elders chosen for their wisdom and education assigns roles to everyone else, luxuries and entertainment are eschewed, everyone is very open, precise, and polite, and bad decisions are kept to a minimum by using wisdom and group consensus. These are all virtues Plato championed in his dialogue. Plato believed that the Republic was an ideal state we could never create because we humans are the cave dwellers, people who can't understand true reality because of the limits of our perception and the imperfect nature of our current existence. However, Lowry inverts this idea to say the opposite. Because we can feel the full range of our emotions, because we can understand history and plan for a better future, because the variety of an imperfect world gives us unique experiences which we can then share with each other in an imperfect fashion, because of all of these things we would never want to give up, a perfect society is impossible. There is a wisdom which you can only gain through pain and suffering. As intelligent and social animals, humans have the distinct advantage of being able to learn from the suffering of others through the medium of stories and empathy. However, even indirect wisdom comes with a cost, because when we understand the pain of others, we feel an echo of it in ourselves. These are the hallucinations I was talking about last week. The fact that we can get so caught up in a description or a retelling that we can feel like we were there. Hell, story immersion is nothing but intentionally induced hallucinations, and it's something we seek out, something that drives us to invent motion pictures, 3D movies, and virtual reality. The community of the giver is a lot like the United State of We, but while the United States doubles down on order to keep chaos at bay, the community numbs its members to the depths of reality to make contentedness easier to come by. And while they manage to pull this off thanks to some supernatural abilities or unexplained future science, happiness and contentedness aren't what humanity really longs for. We want to experience all the highs and lows that an imperfect world throws at us, because we are never so full as when we were hungry. We are never so relieved as when our pain subsides, and we can never love so deeply as when we feel loneliness and loss. Thanks for joining me again today in Dystopia Corner. I hope I'll see you next time when we delve into the layers of Dreamland.